Good evening, everyone. I'm Deborah Hemming, a librarian with Dalhousie Libraries. I'm delighted to be here tonight to welcome you to the virtual launch of This Cleaving and This Burning, the latest novel by Andy Wainwright. I would like to start by acknowledging that Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. We are all treaty people. Before I introduce tonight's author, I'll go over a few housekeeping details. Shortly, Andy will read from his new book. And after his reading, there will be an opportunity for Andy to answer questions from the audience. If you have questions at any time throughout tonight's event, please type them into the Q&A area on your screen. Also, please note that for copyright reasons, we ask that you please not record tonight's event. If you would like to purchase this cleaving and this burning, it's available for purchase through Bookmark. You can order the novel via their web store, simply search Bookmark Halifax, or through phone or email. Of course, an old fashioned visit to the Bookmark shop works as well. They're located on Spring Garden Road in Halifax and open Monday through Saturday. Bookmark asks that all wear a mask and sanitize hands upon entrance to the store. Now, on to the reason why we're all here. I'm delighted to introduce author Andy Wainwright, who was born in Toronto and has lived in the Halifax area since 1972. After obtaining his PhD from Dalhousie University in 1978, he taught in the Dal English department for 30 years, specializing in Canadian literature, creative writing, and the lyrics of Bob Dylan. His first book of poems, Moving Outward, appeared in 1970. And since then, he has published four other volumes of poetry, five novels, two critical biographies, and an opera libretto. His work has been shortlisted for literary awards in Canada, the US, and the UK. And his sixth novel, This Cleaning, This Cleaving, and This Burning, from which he will read tonight, won the Guernica Prize for an unpublished manuscript in 2019. Andy, over to you. Thank you, Deborah, and thanks everybody who's out there for coming to listen. I hope everything uh, can be heard properly. I just want to say a few words about the novel, which I'll hold up. People can see the cover. Uh, this cleaving and this burning is the story of Miller Sark and Hal Pierce. Born on the same day in the same year, who grew up together in the northern Michigan wilderness. Miller is hypermasculine and is always putting his courage on the line, while Hal is more sensitive and self-conscious, and he's struggling to come to terms with his recently discovered gay identity. Miller loves Hal, but could never allow sexuality to complicate their bond. Hal loves Miller, but cannot entirely subdue his sexual feelings for Miller in the name of friendship. Each man is determined to become a successful writer, and both eventually achieve national and even international status. Miller as a short story writer and novelist and Hal as a poet. But inevitably, the depths and tensions of their relationship lead them to a collision that their creative expression and public reputations cannot prevent. So I'm going to start by, by reading a passage uh, from the beginning of the novel, the first opening section of it, in which Miller and uh, Hal are out hunting a bear. He giggled nervously as they crept along the edge of the meadow just inside the tree line. Miller's lever action 3030 clutched tightly in his hand, the sun warm on his cheeks and the sound of the shallow creek blending with the bird song. Shut up, Miller whispered fiercely, you'll scare him. The bear was about 200 yards away, chewing on the spring grass. Occasionally it raised its head and sniffed the air. Casually it seemed as if it had nothing to fear, but they were upwind and froze when it broke off from its meal to look around. So the only betrayal from Miller's point of view would be how stifled laughter. Where the trees began to thin out, Miller, who was in front, raised his hand to signal this was the place. Rest the barrel on a branch, he said, and remember, don't jerk the trigger. Hal had never planned to be the shooter when his friend spotted the bear in the flatland, beyond the junction of three streams where they emptied into the river. All he'd killed were pigeons in the Sark barn with the 22 and the occasional squirrel with Miller in the woods. But this morning, Miller insisted they had to bag some big game and he had to admit more than a mild curiosity as to what that would be like. Have you ever shot one? Sure, in the spring they hang around the cottage looking for garbage. 
They get right up on the porch if you don't deal with them. How do you think I learned to use the gun? Hal didn't know whether to believe this, but told himself that Miller would never have passed up a chance to bring down the animal if he hadn't killed such a creature before. He knelt beside a tamarack, feeling his knees press into the soft earth and found the bowl protruding enough for a rest. The bear was less than 100 yards away now, its flank exposed and glistening in the sun. He sighted down the barrel and was amazed at the bulk in front of him. He could see the flank moving in and out with every breath. When he squeezed the trigger and heard the report a split second later, the bear grunted and lurched sideways. Hit him again, Miller yelled as he levered out the shell and slammed a new cartridge into the chamber. But the bear was lumbering off now across the meadow toward a distant hill. Hal felt sick, Hal, Hal felt sick as he watched it drag its hind leg where the slug had ripped into muscle and tendons. He hadn't even been able to hit it properly and he didn't want to hurt it anymore. Give me the gun, Miller cried, grabbing at the stock. By the time Hal released it and his friend raised the rifle to his shoulder, the animal had dropped into a gully on the meadow's edge. Miller waited calmly for it to emerge and put a bullet in its spine as it climbed the last few yards to safety. I hate tracking when you've blown a shot, he said. Hal knew the comment wasn't personal, but also that Miller never missed. When they came up to the carcass, Miller cut out a clock from one large paw, tossed it to Hal and pressed his fingers into the shining pelt. It'll make a great rug, he said, then added nonchalantly, you lifted your arm. That's why you hit him where you did. Hal crushed the claw inside his fist. Just then he hated his friend, hated and loved him. So what happens is as they start their, their young writing careers, is that Hal starts to write a poem which comes out of this experience uh, with the bear. And uh, this passage is about that. Through his last year in high school, Hal works sporadically on a long poem. He began with Ursus Americanus in a high field overlooking what would soon be named the Hudson River as Dutch sailors met the new world for the first time. The bear had a consciousness that let it sense the coming change for the hills and woodlands. In a series of layered images, he contrasted the animal's instinctive wisdom with the mercantile aspirations of those the crew represented, having the animal looked down the years through its descendants who had eventually witnessed certain key moments in American history, the revolution, the civil war, the conquest of the West and the ruthless rise of commerce everywhere. He intended this violent past to lead ultimately to the murder of a single bear in a wilderness, in a wilderness field by a boy who ironically would reveal himself as the voice and vision of a natural world gone wrong. It would be his way of expiating his personal guilt, but instead he found himself crossing and recrossing a national fault line the cut off understanding between man and his fellow creatures. So he created a youthful figure who meaning well straddled that fissure that often overrode his good intentions with a desire to control what he encountered and be victorious over it. At first it was Miller he was writing about, but he soon ambitiously saw far beyond what he believed about his friend and imagined this figure like the bear present at crucial historical sites and events he would then fictionalize so he could tell a story about them. Thus the young man, as he decided to call him, would begin an idealism and possibility as he signed the Declaration of Independence and helped shape the Constitution only to own a plantation or lead Union troops in the pillaging of Southern countryside, shoot down the buffalo and ride west on iron rails, tell General Custer the 7th Cavalry was almighty and the Sioux would better cooperate. No, here he would have to stop and begin again with the bear's relationship with the Indians before the Dutch arrived and how the tribes took only what they needed from the land never leaving, leaving a carcass to rot and wearing claw necklaces around their necks as protection against their human enemies. Then there would be the growth of factories to contend with and the suffering of people who worked in them during the 19th century. And he described how the young man turned his back on entire communities and looked out only for himself. It was all a jumble in his mind. Eventually some sections were roughed out on the page but, co but covered by crossed out words and lines while others were barely conceived and lacked any definite images. The only part he finished with a little satisfaction was about the bear watching the sailors, which he submitted to the school newspaper just before graduation. Miller wasn't aware of his own behind the scenes contribution, but had plenty to say just the same. The thing about animals is that you can't predict what they're thinking, he pronounced as they walked home after class one day, the passage, uh, sorry, one day after the passage appeared in the newspaper. He was dragging a stick along the white picket fences of the equally white houses, making loud gun-like responses that echoed through the neighborhood. That's what makes them interesting and dangerous to hunt. Even squirrels, Hal asked angrily. 
And Miller was off on one of his instinctive jaunts and didn't notice. Yeah, you remember that bear you shot? Well, I didn't tell you at the time, but he could have just as easily have charged us as run off into the woods. But you would have killed him anyway. I would have stood my ground. And he added in a voice so low, Helmus almost didn't hear him. That's all you can do. Suddenly, Hal felt badly that he'd been so thoroughly, that he'd so thoroughly connected Miller to be the young man in his poem. He'd make some changes so his friend wouldn't recognize himself in any of it. That is, if he ever finished and published the whole thing, it would take years and he didn't know if his ambition would measure up to the task. Besides, there were other things he wanted to write. He didn't know yet what they were, but he knew what they, that they were waiting for him down the road. He thought again about New York and whether he'd ever see Miller there, a war survivor and famous reporter who might or might not give him the time of day. So when I say they grow up together in the northern Michigan wilderness, they, they uh, go hunting and fishing, mainly at Miller's behest. Uh, and one, one time they're up near the Canadian border on the Upper Peninsula, and the forest fire breaks out by spontaneous combustion, and they're trapped. And this becomes a significant experience for both of them. So uh, this is a section about that fire. I can find it. Yeah. For a few moments, they surveyed the situation. It was an eerie, there, for the few moments they surveyed the situation, there was an eerie calm. The wind's going to shift, Noah said flatly. He had propped him, he's, by the way, he's, he's fallen and twisted his ankle, so he's, he's a bit weak, which is unusual for him. He had propped himself standing against the rock, all his weight on his good leg, and was staring up at the ridge line. His face was very pale and the pain showed with each intake of breath. Which way should we go? Hal was worried, but Miller still was his true guide. If it comes around completely, we'll be okay. The ground up there will be hot, but we can get through to the east. If it's the south wind, the only place we'll have left is the river. And I don't know if I can get down there fast enough. He stood still and waited. When we move, we'll leave the tent and blankets. Just take the guns and rods. Then came words Hal had never heard before. You'll have to help me uphill or downhill. Nothing happened right away. Without any wind, the smoke settled and Hal could see the burned remnants of the trees, looking like scarecrows with too many arms. Off to the east, flames lick, still licked at the sky, but without much conviction as if they knew their time was passing. All they had to do was get over the ridge and maintain as steady a pace as they could with Miller's ankle and things would be fine. Miller nodded at him. We might be lucky, let's go. Hal had the heavier Winchester over his left shoulder, while Miller's palm grasped the other, his right hand drenching the barrel, clenching the barrel of the 22 he used as a cane. They were both wearing their packs with rod tips protruding. Hal hated to leave the tent and blankets, but knew they wouldn't fit through the slim portal waiting for them at the top. He staggered upward, somehow making progress as Hal panted under his companion's wounded weight, and Miller grunted and swore. In the lull, there was no other sound at all. Wisps of smoke, rose in almost straight lines from trunks and branches, and bits of ash floated lazily through the air. Hal felt they were in another world from which all life had vanished, but for two tattered human forms that remained. They had just reached the summit, its more or less level surface stretching in front of them for 30 yards or so, when Miller slipped and fell hard. His sharp cry was cut off as his head struck a half-exposed half rock, and he rolled over on his back, unconscious and bleeding from the temple. Hal bent over him, screaming, wake up, Miller, wake up. And he felt the wind in his face, so he couldn't tell from which direction. There was a roar in his ears and smoke again in his eyes and lungs. He grasped Miller by the collar and dragged him toward the far side of the ridge. Each step of torture as the dead weight caught on every obstacle, and the rifle banged sharply into his side. There was no relief, and he knew there wouldn't be until they were safely over the far edge. So he focused without respite on his task his friend's face twisting and rolling, but strangely peaceful beneath him. When he finally had to stop to recover for a moment, he could tell there was no one bearing, one bearing for the wind. It was coming from everywhere. The renewed fire was all around him now, the circle of flames that allowed no exit, rearing up like an enraged animal on his hind legs. A blazing, bleeding bear, he thought, come to take its revenge. He slapped Miller's cheek but got no response, and thought crazily of hoisting him on his shoulders and running full tilt at the northern wall crashing through so they would roll all the way down into the river. But he knew he could never lift him alone, let alone, sorry, he knew he could never lift him alone or move with any speed. 
They'd burn into cinders. He sat down abruptly, coughing and gasping, pulling Miller closer to him. That horrible death was going to happen anyway, wasn't it? The circle was closing mercilessly. Miller, he cried, we were born on the same day. We can't die on the same day. We just can't tell me what to do. So they grow up, they finish high school and uh, Miller enlists in the United States Marines in 1917 and goes off to France because he believes in the cause and uh, that war experience is going to affect him greatly. Hal is more of a pacifist and he goes to New York where he has odd jobs and begins to work on his long poem further. So this first section I'm going to read is about Miller in France. Um, at the Battle of Belleau Wood in uh, 1917, 1918, sorry. And uh, they get pinned down by a German sniper. He and two of his men, there are only two men left in his squad, a man named Raleigh and a man named Kincaid. And they, Raleigh and Kincaid shoot the German sniper out of the tree. And uh, this is where the passage takes up. Miller stared at the young, fair-haired German, dying as much from his false trauma as the obvious damage from the 30 odd six rifles. He hadn't wanted the bear to suffer. That's why he killed him outright rather than pal keep shooting. That's what you did for an animal that didn't understand the origins of its pain, only that a two-legged creature was involved. This man would have known at some point where the pain was coming from. Maybe deep inside, even though he probably spoke no English, he could translate what they were talking about. We won't treat him worse than the bear, he declared. What, Kincaid said? We'll have to make sure he's dead before we leave him. To hell with that. What do you say, Raleigh? You could hear the furious battle sounds around them, but they were cut off from the main struggle now. Absorbed in a quandary, they couldn't sidestep and had, little, and had so little to do, he realized with his instinctive actions of the moment. We could wait here and just let him die on his own. There isn't time, Raleigh sighed. No, nope, but I sure wish there was. You're crazy, both of you. Let's get out of here. Kincaid was livid. Listen, Raleigh, if we do wait for him to die, we still will kill him, don't you see? I guess I do, but that would be to protect ourselves. If we kill him now, it's like, well, murdering him. The conviction in his voice was undeniable. Fuck that, Kincaid shouted, contradicting himself. He'd be getting what he deserved. Even if it got rid of his pain, Miller said. Kincaid grimaced. Miller could see he was darkly torn. You two go on, he said. I won't be long. When they had crept away, Raleigh promising they wouldn't go far without waiting for him, he looked at the German again and saw that he was really just a boy like himself, his face smeared with dirt and bits of, and bits of greenery, but still young and unlined. If I were lying there like you, he thought, what would I want you to do? He picked up his Springfield and placed the tip of the barrel against his enemy's forehead. What were the rules concerning a prisoner? They put the bear out of, their, out of its misery, hadn't they? Even though it hadn't been any threat, this man or boy who had attacked them was now helpless. There was a torn seam in his uniform collar and one of his bootlaces was undone. His eyelids fluttered and he seemed to be trying to speak, but only a garbled sound came from his throat. Then he coughed and there was a splash of blood on his chin. It would be a mercy, Miller thought, as his finger tightened on the trigger. But deeper than his pity, Raleigh's image of murder wouldn't dissolve, which was the moral high ground. Was there any such territory in war? He was crying when he took out the notebook and wrote down the protective words. When he left, the German was still alive. So Miller crawls on to join Raleigh and Kincaid at the bottom of the hill, uh, which is their objective. And uh, they're under fire. Raleigh and Kincaid run ahead of Miller. And uh, this is what happens. Should have marked all these pages rather than looking them up, but I'll find this. Sorry, it's an important passage though. You can do a song and dance, Deborah. Okay, I'm getting there. So Miller watches Raleigh and Kincaid run off. When Raleigh fell, Miller felt a stab of pain in his chest. It was so searing he clenched his teeth and fists in protest and felt tears come to his eyes. 
They were both gone and that left only him for no reason at all. He lay there with his head down for a long time while, the, while flames devoured him. When he finally looked up through the leaves, he could see one of Raleigh's boots sticking over the top of a rock at an odd angle, the rest of him hidden on the far side with Kincaid. His heart raced. By God, he'd made it, but he was either dead or badly wounded. The boot told him that. There was a lot of smoke drifting his way as if somewhere on the slope, someone had lit a cooking fire. That was impossible. No, for once the officers were thinking straight and were creating a screen to hide the advance and give the Marines a fighting chance. He didn't care about the battle though. He'd use smoke to reach his friends and then he'd find a medic. How he'd do that, he didn't know, but his war was over until he did. Maybe it was just over. He didn't want to fight anymore, not without those who died instead of him. He had to save Raleigh and Kincaid so there was no more dying. When the pall descended and he could barely see the tips of the branches, he stood up and ran toward the rocks. As he jumped over them, he could see Raleigh lying face down on top of Kincaid, whose open glassy eyes stared at nothing. The top part of his skull laid open as if by an amateur surgeon, some brain matter smeared across his cheek. Raleigh groaned as Miller knelt down and turned him over, the blood oozing from a throat wound that had punched through his, his Adam's apple and left him sucking air through his ragged remains. I'll get you back home, Raleigh, Miller said. But Raleigh couldn't speak. He blinked in apparent recognition of the words and Miller felt his fingertips grip his pant leg and give a little tug. I'll find a medic, he said, but Raleigh wouldn't let go. The smoke was thinning and he knew he'd have to move soon, a minute or two at most. Then Raleigh slowly held up his other hand and pressed his straight, straightened index finger to his temple, smiling at Miller and giving a slight nod. Miller slapped the hand away, but the finger came back, this time curling around an invisible trigger before extending itself again. Then Raleigh coughed and blood spilled from the wound. I can't, I can't, you called it murder. Not you, not you. You wouldn't leave him then. He'd stay until he died or they both died together. And how long would that take and how much would Raleigh suffer while he lasted? He looked down at the southern boy whose chest still rose and fell, who survived hurricane winds, who had survived hurricane winds. And like he said, comes just, just this far to die. At that moment, Miller loved him more than anyone he'd ever known even more than he loved Hal. Would he shoot Hal if he were like this? Yes, he knew he would. Not back on the ridge in Michigan because the fire wasn't personal, but here because the Germans tried to steal everything from you and you had to stop such robbery. He wasn't making sense. He shouldn't do anything when he wasn't making sense. There was so much noise he couldn't think, but his rifle barrel touched Raleigh's chest as he leaned over him. Then there was a sudden searing pain in his right knee and a dull thud inside his head that silenced everything. Springfield jerked in his hands as the last strands of smoke swirled away and he saw how close the summit was. So that's the greening of Miller, if you like. And it lasts him or haunts him all his life what happened to the German and what happened to uh, Raleigh. And I'm going to read one more passage about Miller. Uh, years later, he's fishing in the, in the Gulf Stream off the coast of Cuba with his Spanish uh, captain. And he had, he's, he, the night before he's had a dream. In his dream, he was in the boat with Manuel, farther out than he had ever been before. It was very hot. And there was not a whisper of wind on the sea. The boats that usually trailed in the wake were gone, except for one man of war that, sorry, the birds that usually trailed in the wake were gone, except for one man of war that hovered over them and with his bright red pouch distended, he set his rod in the metal holder Manuel had bolted to the stern gunnel, and the line was stretched out a hundred yards behind, weighted by heavy hooks and sinkers. Many hours passed as they drifted in the current, and his eyes were smarting from the constant glare despite the glasses he wore and the peak of his cap that protected his forehead. He wished he had brought a book with him or his typewriter so he could work as he waited. Then when the, where the end of the line should have been, he saw a dark shadow ripple, ripple briefly across the surface of the water and called to Manuel. KS, he asked. The old man studied the calm until the shadow appeared again then drew in his breath sharply. Madre de Dios, he said, you must reel in. But why, Miller said, we can catch whatever it is. No, we cannot. This is El Recuerdo. What is that? The fish of memory, senor, one who keeps what we have done and chosen to forget. I'm a writer, Miller said, I remember it all. He picked up the rod and set the butt against his stomach, waiting patiently for the strike. When it came suddenly, he let the line run, then jerked back to set the hook. The weight of the fish was enormous, 
and after bringing in the initial slack, he couldn't turn the crack handle a single inch. Let him run, Miller told him. If you will not cut the line, it is your only hope. Sorry, let him run, Manuel told him. If you do not cut the line, it's your only hope. I will let him run because he will grow tired, Miller replied, releasing the drag. But instead of surging away as he expected the fish, as he expected, the fish sounded, sinking into the depths, nearly stripping the reel in just a few seconds of descent. He knew the creature was real, not a myth, and the ocean here was far too deep for it to reach the bottom and rest. Besides, the length of line would not permit this, so he was surprised when the line went slack again and he had to bring it taut. It meant the fish was strangely suspended in the midair of the current, as if biding its time before its next move. After several minutes, his arm began to tire, and he wondered if he would lose this waiting game. Manuel removed his cap and glasses to pour drink water from a drinking bottle over his head. Cut the line, he said. He is giving you a chance. No, Miller answered. To hell with his mercy. At that moment, he felt the line go loose. He's coming up, he yelled. Get ready. But Manuel would not pick up the gaff as he frantically wound the crank until the rod tip curled into the water. and He knew his catch was just below the surface. Kneeling down to bend over the transom, he reached out for the dark amorphous shape that was shockingly small for all its strength and weight. This is crazy, he yelled as his finger. fingers brushed cloth instead of scales. No, senor, it is the truth. The shadowy form spun several times before he grasped it and pulled it close. As, he turned, as it turned slowly between his hands, he saw it was the body of a man in a forest green uniform, the buttons on the tunic displaying the Marine Corps eagle. He could see through the buttons to the other side and the words Waterbury Button Company, Connecticut, magnified in the clear water. You're not a fish, he said, as Raleigh's face floated toward him, bubbles escaping his friend's open mouth as if he were drowning or trying to speak, the hook cruelly embedded, embedded in his tongue. Miller recoiled before reeling, reeling in, preaching emphatically, frantically to free the barb, weeping at his ineptitude as his hand twisted and turned to no avail. Then Manuel's hand was on his shoulder. Let him go now. You have seen the past and that is enough. His head was throbbing and there was a terrific pain in one of his knees. He wanted to hold Raleigh in his arms and tell him he was sorry, but all he could say was, why did you come back? There was no answer. And finally, nodding wearily at his failure, he took Manuel's offered knife to slice the, hand, the line where it joined the leader. You were wrong, he said, turning to the old man. I haven't forgotten anything about him. Senor, if that were so, El Recuerdo would never have caught you. So how are we doing for time? Okay, uh, one more passage. I'm just gonna read a brief passage, which is a passage about Hal's death. Hal has a relationship long-standing relationship when he lives in Key West um, with a young sailor named Nikki. And Nikki drowns uh, while they're snorkeling one day on the very on the reef off, off the coast of Cuba. And uh, Hal is haunted by it, the way that Noah is haunted by the death of Raleigh. And Hal is on a boat going home from Cuba to New York, carrying his manuscript with him of his long, finally completed long poem. And this is the last passage about him. A sliver of light fired the line of clouds that hid the, hid the rising sun. He walked slowly toward the stern, one hand on the railing, and the other clutching the images with which he tried to invoke his vision. It was too bad he hadn't yet made a copy, but even if he had, how long would it last for readers on their different voyages? The gulf was choppy, and there was a greasy sheen on the crest of the small waves as if the ship was leaking oil or slick dew had fallen during the night. Barely visible to the north, maybe five miles off, the solidity of the last key dropped away to a brilliant underwater reef. He'd been happy the moment before he and Nicky had entered the rocky tunnel, just as he'd been the instant before Miller spotted, Miller spotted the flames in the tops of the pines. He tried. Walt Whitman was his witness, but he couldn't marry word and flesh so we'd have to let go of them both. Opening his hand, he scattered the pages over the water as the sun's rays broke through the clouds to melt the waves patina. He clung to the top railing for a few moments as if looking toward Cuba for reprieve then leapt into the wake. The inscribed sea broke over him like a cry. Over to you, Demra. That's it. Great, thank you, Andy, that was wonderful.
Uh, we're now going to go into a Q&A portion of the event. So if anyone in the audience has questions, I would encourage you to um, type them into the Q&A area. Questions for Andy about his book or his writing. Um, to get us started, um, I have a question. Andy, I'm curious um, how much of the book is based on real life? It's an interesting question because um, on the back cover, as it says, this the book is inspired by the lives and work of Ernest Hemingway and Hart Crane, two legendary American literary figures. And uh, my reading of, of uh, Hemingway and Crane started when I was an undergraduate and then continued in my 20s. And, and I ended up writing a master's thesis on Hemingway and publishing work on Hart Crane. Um, what I didn't know and what I didn't discover until just recently, a few years ago, was that Hemingway and Crane were born on the same day, July 21st, 1899. Their parents both had the same first names, Clarence and Grace. The mother of Hart Crane went to the same high school as the mother of Hemingway. I was fascinated by this correspondence because these were two very, very different men, two very different writers. Uh, Hemingway was that aggressive, hyper-masculine figure uh, and Crane much more sensitive and, and Hemingway wrote clean, precise prose. Crane was a symbolist poet, very elusive in his light use of language. Um, and if they'd met one another, I'm convinced they would not have, not have been friends. So I thought, well, what if they had met when they were very young? And, and so the story came out of that. But it's not a romantic play. You don't have to know anything about Hemingway and Crane to read the novel. And, and I hope appreciate what's going on. If you do know Hemingway and Crane, just adds a little spice to the story. Wonderful, thank yeah. you. Um, one other question um, that I had is, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the title of the book. Yeah, this cleaning and this burning is obviously an unusual title. I mean, it's very loaded metaphorically just by itself, but it actually comes from a line. It's a line in a poem by Hart Crane called Legend. They do not last long, this cleaving and this burning, he says. And it's, it stuck with me for some reason and seemed applicable because to cleave means to to opposite things at times. To cleave means to be part of, to, to, to uh, take hold of, if you like. And it also means to rent asunder at the same time. So something that, and something that cleaves has that dual meaning to it. And that's really what their relationship is about. And the burning, of course, comes from the forest fire and also their relationship, the sexual component to their relationship. That's beautiful. I, uh, I wondered if it might be a reference to either Hemingway or Crane's work. So yeah. thanks for confirming and giving us that reference. The only way I give that away, that relationship away, is that uh, there are two epigraphs at the beginning of the novel, one from Crane and one from Hemingway. It's the only direct signal. Okay. Okay, great. Um, last chance for questions. If if anyone in the audience has questions, feel free to type well, them in now. Has a question? Is there anything in the subject matter or the or what I've had to say um, that interests you enough to ask the question? Anybody what, type anything in? What I really enjoyed about your reading, Andy, was that you instead of just reading one longer passage you you know selected passages throughout the narrative it seems like and really gave us a taste of um the book um oh i see a question has come in um a question uh, that just came in was um i was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the role of the war in their relationship so their relationship i assume is the two the two main characters mm -hmm. Well, Miller is, I said, Miller is that very masculine character who's the man of action. And uh, he believes in the cause. He thinks he thinks the Germans could overrun the United States. There's, they have, he and Howe have an exchange about that. And Howe scoffs at him and Miller says, well, if we don't defend ourselves in France, they're going to end up on our shores. Um, and uh, he, he can't sit still. And he's also, to give him credit, he's looking for subject matter. He, he's, he's, uh, he's already written about Michigan about hunting and fishing and people that he, characters that he met and so on. He's written his, his early short stories at this point when the war starts for him. And so he's looking for something bigger in terms of subject matter and he sure finds it as people will see if they read the book. 
So, Great. so the war, the war is significant, but the war, the external war reflects the internal war, or vice versa. The internal war in both men uh, that has to do with their thoughts and feelings for, about life in general, but also for one another. Wonderful, thanks. Okay, we have uh, another question. Um, Andy, of the various author readings that you may have attended over time, can you tell us about one that has had a strong impact on you? So asking you to reflect on your own experience attending readings like these. Well, that's a question from out of the left field, but it's an interesting one for sure. I would say that uh, I'm gonna throw uh, a little spanner in the works again and say that probably the thing that influenced me the most was going to see Bob Dylan in a concert on the night I should have been at my high school re re um, graduation. My parents never forgave me, but I was at, in a Massey Hall in Toronto watching Dylan, who was a, obviously a writer and a singer and uh, had words that were worth listening to and hearing. So that was a big experience. Um, I mean, I've seen I've seen so many people, both here and, and abroad, uh, that, that uh, had an influence. The poet Ted Hughes, for example, is, is one illustration of that. There are people I would have loved to have seen read, like Patrick White, the Australian novelist, or Lauren Sterl, the British novelist, uh, but did not. But uh, that's about what I can say in answer to that question. It's a good question. Yes, it is a good question. Uh, another question that just came in. Did you find it difficult to balance these two very different characters? You know, I, had, I was giving an interview not long ago about the book, and, and I was asked, did I write the story of one character and then go back and write the story of, of the other character? Which is a good question, but it had never occurred to me to do it that way. They, were, they are so intertwined in spiritually and emotionally, and I was able to move back and forth between them, and their stories complement one another. So when I deal, I deal with one of them in a particular time and place, and I deal with the other one, not in a different place, but at the same time. So that's how I keep control of the, of the, of the subject matter in that way. Interesting. Was there, was there another aspect to that question? That was the that was the main part of that question. Um, yeah, I didn't find it difficult to deal with them because I was so invested in the story I wanted to tell, and they were and and I mean what happens is if you're writing yourself, you know this, you get into something and it just takes over. It's not until the editing process that you really begin to see what you've done. Right. Um, that's interesting. I'm curious. Um, you know, when I read your introduction, it's very obvious that, you know, you're very prolific and you write in different genres, poetry, um, biography, fiction. Are you working on anything now or are you taking a much deserved break after publishing no, this I, novel? No, this book won the, won the um, Guernica Prize last year, last fall, so it's been in production for a year. It's just come out and during that time and, and slightly before that I was working, I've been working on another novel, so I've virtually completed another novel there yet. Wonderful. Okay, another question. Um, you mentioned Hal's relationship with a young sailor. Can you say a little bit more about how he might be attracted to Miller and how Miller responds? Well, well there's a lot. It's funny when you make choices about what you're going to read at a public reading like this. You know, it's it's not easy because you don't you you want to give good give good words out, but you don't want to give things away. And tell the whole story, but I so they're, when they're in the fire together, what happens is everything that I read, Noah, Noah falls and is knocked unconscious, and uh, the fire is closing in around him, and Hal's holding him. And that's where I left off that passage. And what Hal does, a combination of fear and a combination of love, he kisses Noah, Noah's unconscious, and Hal lives with that for the rest of his life because he wants to tell Noah that that's what he did, but he never has the courage to do it. Noah wakes up from his unconscious state and says to Hal, dig, dig a hole. And Noah saves them by telling Hal and the fire passes over them. So I established then that Hal is capable of expressing himself sexually, certainly, but he's very guarded about it and, and conflicted about it. Um, and before this time in the, with the fire, he goes to San Francisco with his mother on a visit and uh, he ends up cruising the Embarcadero, which in those days was a waterfront series of establishments where the sailors all came into town. 
and he ends up with a sailor, and that's where he first expresses his his uh, gay identity. Um, it wasn't called gay then; it was called queer, among other things. Uh, so he knows he knows what, what and who he is, uh, and he meets the he, he ends up with one sailor for a couple of nights, and then they never see one another again until about ten years pass. And he meets him in Key West. He meets the sailor in Key West, and they strike up a long-term relationship together. And that's the young man who dies, who drowns in the uh, swimming with Nick, swimming with um, Hal uh, on a coral reef off the coast of Key West. And so Miller has, as I said, his time with Raleigh, the soldier who dies, and the, and the German who dies in the war. And Hal has Nicky and Nicky's death. So uh, Nicky is an extremely important character. He's not a reader. Hal writes a poem to him, uh, which Nicky appreciates but doesn't understand. But um, that was that's another interesting component I might just mention about the book now that was really fascinating for me. My previous novel I wrote about um, was based on my family uh, history in England. And one of my um, great uncles I made into a poet. And he wasn't a very good poet in my book. So I had to write poetry that was OK, but it wasn't very good. In this book, I had to write poetry for Hal. And if Hal's got anything to do with Hart Crane, Hart Crane was a great poet. I'm not a great poet, but, but I had to write really good poetry in order to, I think, convince readers that uh, Hal was a great, was a very, very good poet. And uh, so there's a poem that he writes for Nikki. Um, as I said, that Nikki doesn't understand, but I think it establishes Hal's credentials. So that was interesting to have to do that. Yeah, that sounds like a unique challenge for a novelist. Um, we do have another question. Mm -hmm. Someone asks, Andy, if you were teaching your own novel in a course on Canadian literature, what previous works or traditions would you align your work with? Well, that's interesting. I mean, there, there, there are writers who have affected me like Patrick White, the Australian novelist, Nobel Prize winner, like Lauren Sterling, the author of the Alexandria Quartet, like Dylan, uh, like James Baldwin, the, the Black American writer. Um, but I wouldn't say that there, and there's any individual work of theirs that I would necessarily send my reader to, to or my student to, to say, here, this is where I came from. Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, I would I would have to debate with myself whether I wanted them. I'd have to say go and read Hemingway's short stories. You'd have to read. You'd have just to get a sense of the prose, because it's a, he's a remarkable writer in that respect. Then you'd have to read Hart Crane's poem, long poem, The Bridge. I mean, Hart Crane published one book of short poems um, called White Buildings before he died, and he and uh, he published The Bridge. So he didn't publish a lot, but The Bridge is a is a great narrative poem. And, and I guess those are the two things I'd have to say people should, would have to go and read. It's a, it's a very good question. I'm not sure whether literature can always, I wouldn't want people to say, oh, now I get it, because I read Hemingway and I read Crane. Because like I said, my novel is not dependent on the, on the two of them. It's enhanced by the two of them, but not dependent on them. Right. Well, hopefully then similarly, a reader's experience reading your novel would be enhanced by reading their work. And I think that's true. And I think that every reader brings their own experience, which enhances the reading, um, enhances the book by what they bring to the novel. Absolutely. Okay, so I think that's it for questions for this evening. Andy, did you want to say any final words? Um, well, I, first of all, I just appreciate the uh, opportunity to do this. So thanks to everybody involved. Uh, and uh, anybody with any who wants to further any feedback can reach me by email. It's just andrew.wainer at dal.ca. Uh, don't forget to visit the bookstore, the bookmark. Great. Great. Well, uh, thank you so much, Andy, for that wonderful reading and for your thoughtful answers to the questions tonight. And thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, just a reminder, the book is available at Bookmark on Spring Garden Road in Halifax, and you can also order it online uh, through Bookmark if you're not based locally. So I guess that's it for tonight. Uh, thanks again. Um, and, okay, good night, everyone. Good night.